So, we had discussed um, 6 theorems, 3 were almost proportional like monotonicity, redux yard absurdum and deduction theorem. Then other 3 were the substitution theorems. So, one is for the equivalent substitution, then the other is uniform substitution in a tautology and the last one was uniform substitution in valid formulas. Right? So, this requires first of all to have some valid formulas. Right? If you have only proportional validity, then of course, first uniform substitution in tautology itself does it, but then we need some more valid formulas for the application of the other theorem. Right? So, you can get some valid formulas merely from the semantics, just by using the semantics very simply. For example, you take the equality laws, so they can be seen very quickly. So, in laws of equality, you will have say t equal to t, this is valid, right. It is obvious. So, because equality symbol is interpreted as the equality in the domain, right. So, some such simple things can be seen very quickly. For example, s equal to t is equivalent to t equal to s. Right. There is nothing more to do, and similarly, S equal to T and T equal to R entails S equal to R. Okay. But equality, these are all the equivalence relations. It shows simply equality behaves like an equivalence relation. There is one more which will be required for the equality in the domain, which is its capability being substituted. That is you have s equal to t and x x by s, this entails x x by t. Okay. Is it clear? All that we wanted here is you have a formula where you have some occurrences of s, then you replace all those occurrences of s by the term t, then also you get the new one is obtained from the earlier, right. That is what it says, that is also obvious, is that okay. Similarly, you can have some others say one point rule. So, here we are evaluating x at one point, it looks like that. So, suppose x does not occur in T, then you can have say for each x, x equal to T and x that entails x x by t is it clear what it says even you can say for equivalence by only entailment See once you take this term x equal to t and you do not have and it should be implies right for each x. So, from this if you get x, so what happens x equal to t then you get x. So, that means to prove this x itself you have already substituted x by t right that is what it says there is nothing more to it, but this can be proved semantically easily by taking a straight model of left and the other one right one. Similarly, if you have there is x, you will have the and symbol instead of implies here. This is also equivalent to x x by t. So, in all these laws when we state, we assume that whenever x x by t expression appears, the variable x is free for the term t in the formula x, that is assumed. 
right we will not mention it once again well this is about one point rule you can have some other laws like empty quantification which says that if a variable does not occur in the formula then you can quantify happily without changing anything right so this says for each x x should be equivalent to x itself when if the variable x does not occur free in x so let's write this and also for the existential quantifier right so it will be same thing as also x small x substituted by t because vacuously nothing will be replaced right small x is not free in x so even if you write x x by t that is same as x it is equal to x right then similarly you have renaming of the variables so which says that if you have some formula say for each x p x then that is equivalent to for each y p y okay this is what renaming of the variable means the bound variables will be renamed so how do we write it it would look something this way for each y x will be same as for each x in x replace y by x but one thing we have to take care that this variable is not getting captured right so we should have if x occurs does not occur free in x then this should hold fine also same thing for the existential quantifier so in this symbolism something is hidden you have to read it that way for each x px for each y py is equivalent to for each x px then you can have commutativity well this says for each x for each y and any formula x that is equivalent to for each y for each x x you can interchange the quantifiers similarly for the existential but both are same that's why if you have a mixed quantifiers then something else can happen right you have only done this one there is x for each y x and tells for each y there is x x the converse does not hold also we know fine that is for each y there is x x does not in general until there is x for all y x in some cases it can then you have distributivity this is a bit tricky right let's see it so here you would get for each x x and y is equivalent to for each x x and for each x y can you see why is it so yeah is it clear so basic intuition is that when you have for each x say over the natural numbers some px and some qx it will say p1 and q1 p2 and q2 p3 and q3 all and together right so you would just separate it out p1 and p2 and p3 and so on and q1 and q2 and q3 and so on right 
this is the basic intuition but that may not happen for r we'll see how it goes with existence similarly r also we have because the existence itself means at least one for at least one it holds so r itself should distribute now if you change this and to r then this may not hold but at least one side would hold for each x x r for each x y and tells for each x x or y is it clear because once you say this or this at least one of this is true in any state so take in that state suppose this one is true then in the same state this is also true right but converse may not hold can you give an example it should be easy suppose you take x as px y as not px fine we want to see that there is a counter example to this fine so our suggestion is take x as px y as not px then if this is true you would have got this right so when you interpret this is a sentence so when you interpret what will happen for each x you will be for each x in some domain d right let's take natural numbers hmm? p is the set of all primes so now this will say take any natural number the natural number is either a prime or it is not a prime which is true right on the right side it says every natural number is a prime number or every natural number is not a prime number is a non prime number right not px that is false right it says either every natural number is a prime number which is false zero is not a prime number or every natural number is a non prime number which is also false because two is a prime number is that clear so this doesn't hold but this hold so we have only one side here entanglement similarly for there is x we'll end all okay is this also clear the same way but converse may not hold again i think the same technique will do so what we want to show is this does not hold there is x px and there is x not px and tells there is x px and not px right so this says there is a prime number this says there is a non prime number which are true both are true right but the right side says there is a number which is both prime and non prime which is false right it is easy to see then we have something on the conditionality if x is a variable which does not occur free in x then you can have some other distributive laws let us take the these cases first entanglement did not hold x or y is equivalent to x r for each x y you can see why it is so once you say x is not free in x it means as if x is not at all occurring in x right because you have renaming so you can rename the variables to something else fine all the bound variables can be renamed so x is not occurring at all then it doesn't matter when you take it out the same for each x will be remaining 
that is what it says. You have just go to the details of the states and it should follow immediately. Right? Similarly, you have there is x, x and y should be equivalent to x and there is x y. So, here it is also equivalent to there is x x instead of x you can also write there is x x because of empty quantification x does not occur at all. So, it does not matter even if you have there is x x in the beginning right. Similarly, on the other one also ok. You can extend it a bit to some implications say you have for is x x implies y. Since x does not occur here, you can take x implies for each x y. Okay. Similarly, there is x, x implies y is equivalent to x implies there is x y. What about the other type? Say for each x, y implies x. Now, this variable x does not occur in capital X that is what it says, it can occur in y right. So, this will not be in general equivalent to for each x y implies x, it will be there is x y implies x. Why it happens? You will realize shortly, huh? just wait a minute, I will keep it star mark. Okay. Similarly, there is x of y implies x will be equivalent to for each x y implies x. See the key is De Morgan, which says not of for each x x is equivalent to there is x not x. That is clear from the translation itself right it is not the case that every man is mortal then you say there is at least one man who is immortal hmm. that's what it says well similarly you have not there is x x is equivalent to for each x not x right with the use of double negation along with it you may get some more like not for each x not x is equivalent to there is x x and similarly not there is x not x is equivalent to for each x x. Now, if you use De Morgan here in the start mark this will be for each x y implies x is equivalent to for each x not y or x. Okay. Now, since x does not occur in x, you may write as for each x not y or x. Now, for each x not y is same thing as there is x y it is negation. right? So, this is equivalent to not there is x y or x that is same thing as there is x y implies x. Is it clear? Why it is changing this quantifier is changing for each x to there is x because there is a not here hmm? same thing is here there is a not here so that becomes for each. Fine. So, these are some of the laws you will discover many more laws yourself will not do the all of them, but at least this much will be helpful for us to go for the next ones. So, basically the problem is for the quantifiers, you have propositional connectives and then the quantifiers. It does not show whether we have really captured all the quantifiers or not, right. There can be some other laws which we will not be able to derive from this, is it complete with all these laws. So, such questions can come up. So, better we should tackle the quantifiers directly, see what happens. Fine. So, one of the basic things is suppose you have a universal quantifier say for each x p x it is true in natural numbers then immediately you go for p of 1 is true right. 
So, in first order logic you do not have 1, you would say that p holds for some term t or p holds for some constant c, that is how you will be proceeding, right. But since it is for each, it will be true for every constant because every constant will be mapped by the state or the valuation to an element of the domain, different elements of course, but elements of the domain. So, for each element in the domain it is true, therefore, whatever constant you choose or replace in place of x that p x would be true, right. So, this gives us a hint for the universal specification. So, here it says from for each x p x from this you can always conclude p t for any term t, right. This is what it is. So, in general we may write x from for each x x you can conclude x small x by t substituted x is substituted by t here, fine. But then do you need any condition there? Of course, since you have the substitution x x by t x should be free for the variable that variable x should be free for the term t in the formula x fine this is what we need. So, let us write it let x be a formula x a variable and t a term such that x is free for t in x, that is the only thing we need. Then for each x, x entails x x by t. Okay. Now, you are writing only in this notation to make it very general, not like p x for each x p x then p c, okay. that is the only difference. So, you can read it that way say p x here, so p of t instead of small x t has been replaced. Once you start with reading that way, it will be easier to read the symbols also. So, just do not read x x by t, sometimes with an example see it what it is. Well, how do you prove it? Proof should be as simple as that. So, it is an entailment. So, we will be starting with a state. We do not know whether that on the left side for each x x is having a free variable or not. If it does not have any free variable, it is a sentence, you can go just for the interpretations, right. So, let us start with a state. Now, what happens? Suppose I L is a state, let us write the whole thing. Is a state satisfying for each x x. Fine. Then what happens? Then for each element in the domain, okay. What happens? I L x fixed to D satisfies x by definition of the quantifier for all, right. So, whatever element you fix to x with that element that formula x is satisfied, that is what it says. Now, then what we do? T is another term. Now, suppose L of t equal to d prime. L is a valuation, so it also evaluates every term as an element in the domain, right. So, it might be some d prime, okay, L t equal to d prime. Then since this is true for every d in particular, we have I L x fixed to this d prime satisfies x, that is the end of the matter, right. So, this says that I L satisfies x 
x by 2 because t is fixed to d prime now that is also l t right l of t equal to d prime. So, it is same thing as taking l x to t that is the end of the proof. So, the same way you can have also existential generalization see the duality. In one you specify the other you generalize they behave the same way. Hmm. Let us see this. So, this says with all these things let x be a formula x a variable and so on it should say there exists x should follow from x x by t that is what it says. Okay. So, here I am leaving those things what is x what is x and what is t right with the same condition as there. So, all that we have to show this x where small x is replaced by a term t if you have got that then you can infer there exists x, x which means you have p c you conclude that is x p x right p is true for 1 then you conclude that there exists x p x is true over n that is what you are doing is it clear. So, you have found that Socrates is mortal then you say some man is mortal that is what basically you are doing when you come to existential generalization fine always you use that in mathematics no suppose there is an existence proof. So, that there exists a number like this then what you do you find out one number job is over huh. but after that only this law works that is why existential generalization is permitted we do not go for that detail in the maths because anyway logic is taking care of it. Hmm. Okay. So, how do you prove it? Proof is similar to this. So, suppose I L satisfies x x by t right then what happens? If L of t equal to d then i l x fixed to d satisfies x ok. So, that is that for some d that means for some d d for some element in d this d we have i l x fixed to d and tells x. So, i l satisfies there is x x that is all. So, these are the easy consequences of the quantification. We have the real job when it comes to universally generalizing it right, but that is also very frequent in mathematics. So, you want to prove that for every x p x then what we will do? Let x be a natural number right. Now, do some manipulations I do not know what they are then finally, you find p x therefore, for all x p x that is the argument you give right. So, you want to show some function is continuous what do you do? Let epsilon be greater than 0 huh? now you construct your delta what way you can construct I do not know, but finally, you construct after construction you show that x minus a mod less than delta implies f of x minus f a mod less than epsilon. Now, you conclude therefore, for every epsilon that holds then f is continuous right. This is very standard proof, but what it says is that you have started with p x hmm? then ended with for each x p x when is that always allowed. I gave you that example of Sahadeva's skill in Mahabharata did I give no. See it is mentioned in Mahabharata that Sahadeva was very skillful Sahadeva the youngest of the Pandavas he was so skillful 
that even if it rains heavily, he will not get wet, he will go around it. Huh? So, here is a proof. Let x be a raindrop, it can be avoided. Therefore, all raindrops can be avoided <laughs> by universal generalization. So, there is some fallacy in it, right. Then, in which cases it is allowed, which cases it is not allowed? For example, we see that p x does not entail for each x p x that is clear, right. The way we have defined the semantics this does not hold, is it clear why it does not hold. But if you take the universal generalization of this, universal closure of this, right that enters this there is no problem. So, for sentences there is no problem, if there are open formulas then there is p x does not enter for each x p x that we know clearly. Huh? Why is it? Can you show it? This should be easy because all that it says this you must construct a state which satisfies p x, but it does not satisfy for each x p x. So, take a state say take the interpretation first then you have to consider the state. So, you have to take one interpretation where for each x p x does not hold just the earlier one say p is for prime right every number is not a prime we know now you give one state l where l of x equal to 2 so p x is now read as 2 is a prime number that does not enter every number is a prime number right so it is clear p x does not enter this then how to formulate this where it holds we see that if there are sentences there is no problem right Okay. So, now this is a premise from this premise we cannot conclude for all x p x is that okay? but then suppose you have some premises where x is not free then you can conclude there is no problem fine. So, we now formulate it in this way. So, let we should start with a set of premises be a set of formulas x a formula x small x a variable which is not free in sigma which means it is not free in any formula of sigma right. Then what do we conclude? If sigma entails x then sigma entails for each x x. What is the difference between that example and this? Here, somehow you have proved that already sigma entails x. So, even if that variable small x is free in capital X, right, it is really arbitrary, it could have been taken anything else also, right, that is the point. Because otherwise, from sigma entails x, where x is not free at all, how can a free things come? That is the difference. Do you see the constant? Constant is suppose this is p x, right? Sigma entails p x. Then what it says in sigma that small x doesn't occur at all. It's not free. So equivalent entering doesn't occur at all. Now how come this becomes free here? It could have been really arbitrary. So that's the meaning when you say let epsilon be fixed but arbitrary <laughs> in analysis. Okay? So it says that I don't need this as a premise from whatever premise it may be it does not matter for this x also this holds therefore, for each x p x also it should hold. Okay? Is the formulation clear then we will go to prove it proof should not be difficult. So, what do you want to prove sigma entails 
for each x x fine. So, let us start with say I l is a state which satisfies sigma fine. Then as sigma entails x I l also satisfies x ok. Now, the question is how do you say for all x x where from it will come you have done I l satisfy x where small x can be a variable it does not matter right. So, if small x really occurs or it does not occur then there is some difference possibly right. So, it is really the interesting case is when small x really occurs if it does not occur there is nothing to prove that you can take as a separate case. So, if x does not occur then for each x x and x are equivalent by renaming uh, by empty quantification right. So, there is nothing to prove. So, let us take this case when small x really occurs in capital X fine. Now, when you say I l satisfies x you have l of x is some d in your domain because it is occurring ok. So, then what happens is I l x fixed to d also satisfies x is that right ok. Is it clear? Then you want to show that I l should satisfy for each x x we have only shown I l x fixed to d satisfies x. Is it true for every d? Hmm? Is it true for every d? If every d then you have for each x x x otherwise you will not get that. Can you vary d here l x fixed to d satisfies x? Well, we do not know whether we can vary or not. So, let us take any other interpretation any other state say l prime ok. Now, what happens if you take i l prime x fixed to d that will also satisfy x because all that matters is x fixed to d whether it is l prime or l if l prime and l agree on all the other things right and you have x fixed to d then whenever this satisfies this also will satisfy do you see the reason here l and l prime are different right but l x fixed to d l prime x fixed to d evaluate the same d right the valuation of x in under both is same d is it clear. So, once l and l prime agree okay, on all the variables except x then we see that l x fixed to d is the same thing as l prime x fixed to d because both of them evaluate x to d is it clear. So, really you can vary and that is the point that is the crucial point in the proof is it clear now for every l prime or every d also you can take does not matter because you can vary this l prime is it clear. Hmm? See once we say l x fixed to d this valuation will evaluate x to d always. Now, we are concerned about x to what other variables we are not concerned right they are l or l prime we may say they agree from the beginning let them agree on all the other free variables right x we are worried. Now, for x l x to d or l prime x to d are same both of them evaluate x to d. So, this says I l x fixed to d satisfies x and I l prime x to d satisfies x whenever l prime agrees with 
L except on X. This is what we have got. Okay, is it clear? Okay. We have only L X equal to D. Our aim is to show that I L satisfies for each x x. This is what we want to show. Fine. Or for each d in d, I L x fixed to d satisfies x. This is what we want. That is what we are writing. Why do we need to bring an L prime at all? But how do we write that x is not occurring free in any formula of sigma, therefore, it does not matter what value we fix to x? It has to figure out in the valuations, right? That is what L prime does. Is it clear? That is what it is doing, nothing else. So, this is another way of looking at the semantics that if you take L and L prime two valuations which give uh, the same values to all the variables except x, right? they are called equivalent valuations and for all equivalent valuations you have the same valuation for the small x then you have proved for each x x. Right? So, which says instead of varying the elements in the domain you vary over the valuations because any evaluations will cover all the points in the domain D. right? So, it says for whatever L I take L or L prime whatever valuations I choose I get always I L x to D satisfies x for each valuation L. Is that clear? So, this says not even D we say that for each valuation L under I I L x fix to D satisfies x. Right? Then from that it follows that I L satisfies x or I satisfies x. If it is a sentence, you can go for I directly. Otherwise, I L satisfies x. Right? So the crucial condition is this: that x is not free in sigma. If x is free in sigma, you cannot do that because x is already fixed. You cannot vary the valuations now. That is happening. Similarly, if you go for the existential specification, it gives a lot of trouble. Huh? Not only this much, there will be some more constraints. Let us see what is the reason. Okay, Let us give an example why this gives problem. Suppose you have say uh, look at the intermediate value theorem. right? You want to apply intermediate value theorem to find a root of a function. Right, or some polynomial, let us say, root of a polynomial at a point in an interval, say minus 1 to 1. So, what do you do? You say f of that minus 1 is negative, let us find, and f of 1 is positive, let us say minus 1 and 1, then 0 lies between minus 1 to 1. So, there is a point where f becomes 0. Right? What is that point? We do not know. Right? Now, how does it help you? That might be the end result you are satisfied, but suppose that is not the end result. You want to use that point somewhere to do something else. Fine. So, what is the way to go about it? Immediately you say, let alpha be that root. <laughs> because you know it has a root, now you start. Let alpha be a root. Now, use that alpha wherever it is required. Then finally, what will be your conclusion? Will it have alpha there somewhere? Huh? If alpha is there, then your statement in the theorem should be if alpha is a root of this, then right. But usually it is not there, you have used it as a tool only inside it, right. So, that means in the theorem itself, alpha does not appear. 
somehow it is eliminated right and you conclude something else that is the usual procedure you do. So, suppose you are using this intermediate value theorem or finding this root as a tool only that is not your m. So, in while proving something you use that you get let alpha be 0 of f then f of alpha equal to 0. Now, continue doing something finally, alpha is not there. So, your theorem is proved right. Okay. So, that is the scenario of existential specification. Can you say that there exists p x and tells p alpha or p c? That is our point. Then how did you use it in the proof? Huh? Do you understand the question? So, question is suppose I say there exists x p x, does it entail p c for a constant c? Which constant? You will say there exists a constant, then it does not help because it is same thing as the earlier. So, when you say let alpha be that root or alpha be such a root that you cannot say that, huh? there can be many. So, if you say alpha is a root such that f of where f of alpha is 0, you are telling it is a root, how do you write this alpha? Is it really a particular number? It is just a name having that property, right? Okay? It is an ambiguous name, we do not know what it is, but we are using it. So, this is the question if there is x p x given can you derive c from it say p c. Well, I think we will end with this question. Huh? 